are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. To another episode, and today we are going to uh, delve into a fascinating topic, negotiation and sustainability, and how to negotiate successfully for it. And we do it with an expert, somebody that's been training people in the impact space for many years, startups, policy makers. We do it with Ben Kimura Gross. Ben, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Samuel. Ben, you have been in the corporate world, you have discussed your work, and now you are at the forefront of this movement, how to helping people to negotiate better for their sustainability journey. But of course, the first question is, who is Ben and what is your sustainability journey? My sustainability journey, I was always a little bit on that path, you know, not driving a car and all these kind of like, you know, what, what you can do personally to live a more sustainable and life that's respectful of nature. But I wasn't involved professionally on that track until about two years ago. So I've been training corporate and government leaders in negotiations and conflict resolution. And a lot of the corporate leaders that I used to train though worked in boulevard news media companies, car manufacturers, things like that. And about two years ago, a friend of mine said, Ben, you're doing a good thing, but you're doing it for the wrong people. And he got me to drop everything I do and give up all my corporate clients and just take a deep dive into how I can, as a negotiator, help people who are working for more sustainable, circular, and regenerative practices, you know, in business and in life. And I zoomed in on two groups that you already mentioned also, which is impact startup founders and policy advocates. The rest is history. And it's a common trend. You see, for your Eureka moment was your friend, for other people that we had in the podcast. It's encouraging that people, they have corporate careers, they really but struggle to get the purpose. And now you have found your purpose, supporting with your skills and talent, people in their journey. And you mentioned a lot also checking the website and your discussion that a good negotiation can be a more powerful agent for change. So how do you view the role in negotiation in really achieving sustainable change, especially in the context of the corporate context? Let me start off with a, you know, kind of a joke that's going around amongst pro negotiators. So imagine you somewhere that you met the love of your life and you want to ask her to marry you. So you ask her and she says, no, and you're shocked and you don't know what to do. What would a pro negotiator say? I can work with that. You know, the difference is that you know negotiators are trained to deal with no as just a part of the conversation. And let's face it, change makers in corporations, especially change makers pushing for sustainable change, you know, they're faced with a lot of resistance and they hear a lot of no. And because trained negotiators are masters of dealing with resistance and turning that no into a yes, you know, this negotiation skill relevant to achieving sustainable change? I would say yes. I want to go a bit deeper in that. Can you share a bit some examples and practical example of, of this work? So how you can, let us say, avoid sometimes the no's or the bad compromise and go for a positive change. So examples of people or that success or corporation that avoid that compromising in their journey to sustainability. One of my favorite examples is the example of how Nelson Mandela in 1994 negotiated with a white supremacist called Consen Jun, who was a general of the army, who had split away. And, you know, this was the time when the discussion was, will there be a open vote that includes, you know, people of all races to vote for the next president of, this, of South Africa? And it had just been decided and Nelson Mandela had stepped up as a presidential candidate. And... Constant Beljum put together a group of roughly 50, 55,000 armed militants and who were willing to start a civil war and gave Nelson Mandela an ultimatum. Step down from the candidacy or we will start a civil war. Now, the country was already in the throes of a lot of violence at the time. And there was already lots of uh, extrajudicial killings of political people, but also just random killings to kind of stoke that violence and resistance against the democratic path that was one potential path for 
South Africa. What Nelson Mandela did was quite surprising because let me describe first of all what he didn't do, which is something that a lot of politicians these days do, right? Think of uh, Germans, so our Bundeskanzler Scholz sitting at the table with Putin, right? I have a huge table in between them. And, um, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of thumping the table during the discussion. So that's not what Nelson Mandela did. You know, he didn't get into a big conference room or some big ministerial palace and, you know, do the table thumping, you know, threat, counter threat kind of negotiation. What he did is he invited Constantine Jun to his home. And of course, this is not like I would invite you to my home. It's more official than that. But still, he's inviting him to his home. He's asking him to come to the living room, sit down on the sofa, offers him some tea, asks him if he wants milk, asks him if he wants sugar, tries to make Constantine Jun first of all, feel at ease. And that's something really, really powerful in negotiations that we underestimate. So he makes him feel at ease and he sits him down and he actually sits down next to him on the sofa. So here's Nelson Mandela and a white supremacist sitting next to each other on a sofa, having a cup of tea, while discussing the question of whether Nelson Mandela should step down from the presidency or, if he doesn't, face a civil war initiated by an army general with 55,000 arms. The outcome is that Nelson Mandela convinced Constable June to put down arms and become a politician. And five years later, when Nelson Mandela finally stepped out, Constable June, the white supremacist, had learned Xhosa, which is Nelson Mandela's native language, and did a very emotional goodbye speech in the South African parliament when Nelson Mandela stepped down. How do you achieve that? One of the things that practical experience shows that my experience in corporations and also in work with the government shows and that also research shows is that one of the most powerful things you can do with negotiating with these big goliaths who have no reason to change and who think who, they, they think they've got the power to just take you by the neck and ring it and do whatever they want with you. One of the most powerful tools you have is compassion. Compassion sounds kind of like wishy-washy and, you know, oh, empathy and you know, <laughs> but I'm talking about tactical compassion. What it's about is compassion is the emotional component that allows us to perspective switch and to really understand each other. And that's really, really tricky because in a lot of negotiations, especially when you're going to head to head, people don't want to understand each other. They just want to push harder than the other guy. This is one of my favorite examples of a negotiation that achieved almost magical results getting a white supremacist to respect you so much that he learns your mother tongue and holds a goodbye speech in front of parliament in that mother tongue, not in Afrikaans, but in Xhosa. That's magic. Now you have preempted a bit the question when I was listening to you. It's a really powerful story, a powerful example on how to use compassion. And can you share, you have mentioned that, can you share a bit of how we can show it? What are the steps? that we can use to negotiate differently, especially when fostering important goals like the one you have discussed or the sustainability goals. What's important to you is just fostering those sustainability goals, right? If we can look at practical steps, that would be really helpful, right? So you see, what I've just done is I've kind of paraphrased what you said, and we underestimate how something as simple as paraphrasing, because paraphrasing is really a simple thing. If you, you, know, you listen to what your counterpart says and you put it in your own words. But what is that? do to you when I asked you those two questions just now. Fostering sustainability goals is important and you want to, you think that, right? And you think that having some practical examples of how to do that is important or is useful too, right? How does that make you feel at that moment? Make you reflect on the issue and, and really like stop because if, if I am somebody against it, like, wow, I have to think and stop in putting myself on the other side. Yeah, and just by me paraphrasing what you said, one feedback that I often get is, for some reason, I feel like you get me. You understand me then. <laughs> in fact, I had this wonderful experience at a barbecue party with a client who'd invited me to his home at a barbecue party with friends and family and everything. And um, he was having some discussion with his wife. And then he, he turns to me and he says, but, you know, you get it, right, Ben? Because Ben gets me. <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, in front of people that he's known for 20 years and a wife that he's been married to for 25. <laughs> and I was like, well, actually, what I'm doing is I'm just using some techniques and tactics that are very, they leave a very strong impression that I get. Of course, I also want to get people. I think any negotiator who doesn't do really powerful perspectives, which 
and who doesn't try very hard to get their counterpart to really get them is not a strong negotiator. So it's part of the skill set. And at the same time, it was kind of surprising for me at that party because I was like, mm, yeah, I've learned how to do that to make you feel that. And that is also part of what makes people feel a connection. Now, another thing that can kind of cause empathy, right, or cause a, a sense of connectedness is I'm going to use a technique now, and then we'll discuss it in a moment. But before I go on, I'd like to go into a deep theoretical discussion about what's the difference between compassion and just regular cold-blooded cold perspective switching and uh, something called emotional contagion. Right? There's some deep research done on this by a guy called Frank Tavas. Now, in your face for a moment, I could just see like, oh, no, this is becoming really theoretical. So what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to, I see you smile, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it seems that you're worried whether your listeners are going to really enjoy all this theory. It's an interesting question, but it's also important because if they don't grasp, of course, it will be very difficult for them to understand the proper linkages. So, And did you notice what I did there? I actually used a technique called labeling. I'm picking up on a potential negative emotion that you may have, right? And by the way, the three types of uh, empathy, you know, compassion, cold-blooded perspective switching and uh, emotional contagion is really, really interesting as a topic, but I didn't really mean to go into it. I just meant to kind of dive off into a little bit of theory to make you feel like, oh no, this is becoming really theoretical. I don't know if this is really what I want on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then to create that feeling of like, oh wait, is this, and then to say, it seems like you might be worried that this is becoming too theoretical for your listeners. People don't like doing that. They don't like labeling the negative emotions of their counterparts because they think they're opening up a can of worms. But that's actually the worst metaphor you can have for labeling. The best metaphor you can have for labeling is kind of like shining sunlight on a vampire. You see, negative emotions, they when they're in our subconscious, they're kind of just like there and they're bothering us, but we don't know why, but it makes us less concentrated and less focused in a conversation. And it makes us block off our counterparts too. Any ideas that they might put forth, any proposals that they might have. So it's actually really powerful to address negative emotions. And this is also one way to generate a sense of compassion. Later on, it might be interesting for us to talk about manipulations a little bit. And you can even use this technique when somebody's trying to manipulate you. So don't underestimate the power of paraphrasing to create a sense of um, shared understanding and thereby compassion and labeling. Those are two really, really powerful techniques that I think people can use a lot more to unblock the path towards the change that they want to achieve, to handle the resistance that they're encountering. Fantastic, Ben. And of course, I mean, I'm really willing to go and to discuss and see how, you know, we can avoid the manipulation uh, part. But a question that I also want to ask is, we have discussed maybe the policy side, and now one part that is really important is how you support the change makers, especially startups, in their journey. It's really important at early stage how you negotiate with your investor, with funders, to defend your stance on some of the issue of sustainability. So how do you do? Which are the challenges that they, they have to address and which technique and how do you train them to overcome them? <laughs> there are so such a huge variety of challenges and there's, of course, also techniques. I used to train the police in Germany. In fact, I trained one of the negotiation trainers of the police. She wrote a comment that I, I think it might actually be something that she wrote also as, a, as like a recommendation for me once some time ago. And she said, you know, one of the weird things about Ben is you don't know what's going to happen next because there's just this bag of tricks and he pulls one out and it just fits like a key in a lock. I always try to, to simplify and to say, okay, these are the main things you should learn. But the reality is most of the startup founders that come to me have a very specific problem. For example, let's say a problem with negotiating how much equity they give to investors 
or a problem with negotiating uh, in, a, in a term sheet, right, with a VC fund, negotiating basically risk management provision. These are provisions that, that give the investor control over certain kinds of decision-making processes. Or they come to discuss uh, shareholder agreements or disagreements with other founders, or the variety is really great. And I feel like more than having one set of techniques that always work, I have a bag of tricks and I show them which one's going to work, like the lock and the key. Maybe let's have a look at a few typical situations, right? One typical situation was two investors that came to a group of startup founders and said, we agreed on 3.5%, but we'd like seven each. And they wanted to renegotiate that. Now, these investors were family related and they had they were older than the founders. So there was a lot of pressure points for the founders to just give in or or to maybe just say, oh, they, the founders basically came to me and said, like, what should we give them? 4.5? Um, and these investors were also, because they, they, they were older, experienced in the corporate world, and so they could also give clients to these founders. And I said, there was a time when you agreed on 3.5%. What's changed? What makes anything different right now? And I said, well, nothing really. It's just that they're seeing that we're becoming successful and they want a bigger part of the cake. So I practiced the technique with them, which kind of, again, goes into this emotional roadblock that you encounter when you want to negotiate the deal that is best for yourself. That may not be in the interest of your counterpart, but there's not always the question, right? <laughs> I mean, is your counterpart really, is it ethical for them to turn around and say, we want more, right? After you've already ha made an agreement, of course, it's not ethical. But the only way you can kind of save the relationship as well as stick to the 3.5% is to before you start negotiating about how much, or before you start insisting that you're not going to give them more than 3.5%, you um, take care of the emotional roadblock. And one way to take care of the emotional roadblock is to address what the investors might be feeling if you were to only you know, stick with the 3.5%. So to basically say, look, this might make you feel like I'm not respecting how much you've already done for us, and it might make you also feel frustrated that perhaps I don't value the work with you and I don't value our network or the network that you've brought to us, the potential clients you could bring to us. Plus, of course, there's the family bonds. So I understand that this could come across as massively disrespectful. And then you wait. And then if you just wait them out, usually what happens is that in a situation like this, your counterparts will jump on that. You're right. This and this and this and what I feel. And then you just, you don't defend yourself. You say, Oh, okay. And, and what else? And you just let them really blow off their steam. And the thing is, here's the funny thing again. Once they've blown off your steam and you've taken it on board and you basically just say, look, I'm really sorry about that. And at the same time, looking at the future of our company, looking at the potential of further investments down the line, um, looking at the risk of giving away too much equity at this point, I'm sure you agree that it's also in your best interest as well as in the companies that we stick with what we've got because we're doing a really good job and it's going really well. Let's just keep this thing going exactly as it is. So why is that more powerful than hitting them with logical arguments right from the beginning? It's because the emotions are there. You have to get through that. We have to show compassion for that. But we've done so much for you already, more than we expected we would, or whatever it is, right? And if you show them the compassion and the respect at that point, and you undo the emotional roadblock, then the logical discussion becomes so much easier because it's not burdened by the emotion. So this is one very powerful technique that these startup founders used successfully, and they stayed exactly at their 3.5%, right? Not 3.7, not 4.2, nothing. It's really powerful also to diffuse people that they might want to compromise on some of the issues, uh, especially if they want to put economic pressure and economic points on your stability or social goals that you want to foster. So it's a really powerful technique that really can help and support, and I know you are supporting many companies in that part. I want to ask, I mean, going back to what we discussed before, what if somebody comes to us and then try to manipulate and say, try to derail us from our path, saying, you know, how we can defuse somebody that wants to say, mm, leave your this uh, 
touchy feely sustainability thing you know just bring it to the point i mean i want more how you diffuse people in that in that area now you also diffuse the manipulation technique because we also know that the enemy in a way can be equipped with the same tricks i used to train corporates they all use these tricks but there's no trick against true compassion whereby um, there's the most powerful things you can do in a negotiation is to know who you are know your mission and to really believe in it, that deep compassion as well as the vision that the strategic vision that you're going for and how they connect with each other and how you really want to interact with people so there's things like compassion training and, and stuff that addresses reflexes that we have that are deeper than just the words we choose to say reflexes that connect to for example the tone of voice reflexes that connect to how we react when somebody comes across aggressive or confrontational and you can retrain all these reflex now some people have them like magically they just have a super high level skill for being perfect negotiators they were born that way <laughs> and i envy them because i certainly wasn't you know you know i had to learn all these things the hard way and so i think i understand how to train people because i didn't come into this life as a talented negotiator let's just put it that way for some hard negotiations yeah if i'm in a powerful position but not for the compassionate conflict style of negotiating that i now that i now train people in. there are techniques for for addressing these really deep level behavioral reflexes and this is one of the most amazing components of negotiation training as far as i'm concerned right this is why i also when i learned about all the stuff i delved into brain science and into the psychology of it and things like that behavioral psychology let's just take a a typical kind of manipulation that you face and i'll give you the choice somewhere like what kind of manipulation is the one that you encounter most often and that frustrates you right one the impossibility claim so what you're proposing is just impossible stop being that whatever unicorn like type of dreamy dreamy hippie who thinks that this is it's just not going to work it's impossible and the other one is let's take the higher power excuse samuela i would love to help you but honestly it's not up to me my superior blah 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 blah, blah, blah and the story it's a big dilemma <laughs> maybe so so the listenership will be and then pushing in a webinar i think in the corporate world sometimes and an excuse that we find is the second one sometimes the ladder and the people know it's not me it's the board it's not me i wish we can do that it's a wonderful idea and i think it's also used a bit to not say outright in the past oh they, i think this is bullshit and impossible but let's use this excuse in a way that deflects more i, f- I feel better mm-hmm. sorry i understand you but you no know, those top guys is difficult just forget about it What do you think? It seems Samuela that that must be quite frustrating for you. We're basically on one page but your superior is telling you that this is impossible, right? Or your superior has made up their mind that this is not going to happen. So when you're feeling that kind of frustration that actually you want to make something happen but your superior is blocking your way, is there anything I can do to help you with that? That's a very good question. You know, sometimes you feel powerless. or or you feel anger and you feel also disappointed and that is also where maybe a lot of employees now they want to quit at that point because they have my brilliant idea and things and then it's also a risk for a company in a way yeah yeah definitely <laughs> and when you're describing these things to me that people feel frustrated or disempowered or even angry you notice i'm paraphrasing again right and now you and i are having a conversation about what it feels like to be frustrated disempowered and angry at your boss now the thing is you have to come across truly compassionately right i mean this is where the deeper level compassion training comes in but if you do this really well you can turn a higher power excuse into a conversation about how can i help you to overcome the resistance from your superior and then you're back in the game of negotiating and these people they try to throw up a roadblock against you and what you've done is you you know you've just got past that roadblock by being empathic by using a technique called labeling which i talked about i don't know 10 minutes ago 
And I don't know if you noticed, but that's exactly the technique that I use to start yeah. off our conversation yeah. about. Yeah, no, it's a very powerful because you can even smoke out people that are really on your side or just using excuse, not buying it. So it, it's quite powerful and fantastic. I hope also the people are enjoying this exercise <laughs> that we are doing here, in here together. Can I, can I just point out one thing, though? Because I, I get a lot of pushback on the labeling technique from people who say, but what if they really are just trying to manipulate you? And then you come at them with this emotional wish-wash, right? They seem to be quite frustrated, right? And they don't really care. They're like, yeah, well, no, I'm not frustrated. That's just the way it is. And then you say, okay, well, so I understand. So you've just given up. You've resigned yourself to your own powerlessness. Now, the thing is, you're hitting them with where it hurts because people who try to manipulate you want to be in charge. They want to be in control. And you're basically saying, oh, but it looks like you're not in control vis-a-vis -vis your boss. If you're lucky, then they get a bit confused and they may even say things like, no, 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 but I am in control. And now they're contradicting themselves, right? And then you give them a, a kind, compassionate way out, which is, ah, I understand what you were really saying is that your boss doesn't like this idea. And, you know, if we just put it on his lap, he'd say no, but I'm sure that you know how to nudge him in the right direction, right? Which is... It's a hidden compliment and it's giving them a way out of their, you know, the, the contradiction that they've just wriggled themselves into, right? So in some senses, when you're dealing with truly manipulative people, you also have to get manipulative. And I'm really sorry, but there's no way around that. You just have to, you know, it's like chess. You just have to be better. And it's really a very practical lesson and a practical demonstration on how and especially you can sometimes feeling like a, a small David, as you say, against a Goliath, and, but then you can overcome them, and especially using the technique, the compassion, and the living simple techniques in a way, if you are learned, but they can really shift the perspective and make magic, like in the case and the story we discuss about Mandela. I really want to thank you for this uh, wonderful episode, and we have the last question that we usually say to our guests. Which message do you want to give to our audience? There's more power within you to change others and to get others to align with your ideals and your desire for impact than you. We all carry that power in us. And it's more than just a talent. It's trainable. And I think that's really, really powerful. And the other thing is that 99% of the times in my experience, when you feel like your counterpart is being confrontational or they're not on your side or stuff like that, it's, it's, it's just got a different way of looking at the world. And the real skill is for us to take on that responsibility of opening doors in their minds, knowing how to do that and finding alignment. Like for example, from the startup founder perspectives, you know, investors aren't the bad guys. They might sometimes give you some conditions that you think, where did this come from? They are on your side if they weren't they wouldn't be investors. I mean, they want to invest into startups, right? So I think one of the things is also for most situations in your life, when you're negotiating, assume that you're sitting there because you want to achieve something with the person that you're negotiating. You want to achieve something with them where you collaborate and you build a shared vision, whether they know it or not. I really appreciate a lot the, the messages, you know, even it was another small lesson in a way on, on the dilemma. But those are the practicalities that can really foster the sustainability journey for companies, businesses, and even for activists. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a real pleasure and honor having you here at the podcast. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed the episode and you'd like to learn more, please reach out to Ben on LinkedIn or on the website in the description are you satisfied after this wonderful episode let's continue together our sustainability journey